Welcome to Education Forum. I'm Herman Badillo, Chairman of the Board of Trustees of the City University. The improvement of education affects all New Yorkers. This program will focus on the key educational issues and challenges before us all. My guest today is Sal Cohen, who is a member of the Board of Regents and Chairman of the Committee on Higher Education and Professional Education. Uh, but he's much more than that. Uh, Dr. Cohen is a political uh, geographer, and he has written 12 books and many articles, and uh, he's a graduate of uh, Harvard College and received his MA and PhD from Harvard University. And uh, uh, most important from the point of view of the City University, he was president of Queens College from 1978 to 1985, and after that he became a professor at uh, Hunter College, where he is now Professor uh, Emeritus. Uh, but uh, uh, we are especially uh, interested in him because of his uh, uh, activities in the Board of Regions. So, Sal, welcome uh, with us today. Thank you very much, Herman. Uh, Delighted to be here. Sal, well, I want to thank you for the help that you gave me and uh, the City University in approving the remediation resolution because that is within exactly your jurisdiction in the Higher Education Committee. Um, how do you see uh, the uh, future of the City University now? I'm very bullish about the City University. You don't have to thank me for my efforts at that time. Uh, I felt it was a modest payback uh, for my wonderful years at the City University. And I think that um, I had a better handle uh, on the needs and the prospects of this university than some of my colleagues who hadn't lived this experience. I think what was missing from the whole debate, the part of those who were opposed to the new policy, was failure to understand that the new regents' policies are going to prepare a much stronger generation of college-bound students. By the year 2003, every graduate will have had to pass all five regents' exams. Every New York City graduate will be prepared for college. Now, we've been missing out on a lot of those graduates in recent years. Well, we've been missing out on a lot of uh young people graduating from high school because the dropout rate before the ninth and tenth grade right. has been astronomical. But, uh, you know, so we have two jobs to do. You're quite right. One is um, a stronger university, and this is a stronger university, it requires a public perce perception, you know, that, that it's good and getting better, and I think that's beginning to take place as a result of the new policy. Secondly, this university is getting deeply involved in this whole pre-K to 16 right. uh, process. Now, you know, I had a lot of fun with that when I was at Queens, as you recall. We were lucky enough to create the uh, Louis Armstrong Middle School. We recreated Townsend Harris High School at Queens College. And you also set up the law school. Set up the law school. But, you know, when I did it in those days, I, I did it sort of solo. Mm -hmm. um, Whereas now, the university, through the board and the chancellor, has said, hey, the New York City school systems are, are our responsibility as much as anyone else's responsibility, right. and you're creating the programs which, uh, which are going to do it. And we also were very lucky to have Chancellor Levy, who was a member of the Board of Regents, become the chancellor of the Board of Education because he immediately agreed with us in expanding the College Now program, which uh, trains the young people uh, to every high school and beginning in the ninth grade so we can begin to work with the students in the ninth, tenth, eleventh, and twelfth grades. Well, the planets are now in alignment. In right. the 22 years that I've been here, we've never had a situation where the two chancellors right. act as one voice. Mm -hmm. And now we have, we have that. You know, 13 or maybe 15 years ago, I remember coming up with this idea that we needed a fifth year, special fifth year program. Yes, let's talk about that because yeah. there's been some discussion, but nobody has really developed it. And I know that you started it, so I'd like to hear what that means exactly. Well, I, I prepared a fully developed plan 15 years ago, which went nowhere, which said, look, at least 20% of your high school seniors in New York City, and maybe more, are spending their fifth and even their sixth years in high school. 
nothing differently is done with them. That is, they, they go back and they're told, well, you repeat course A, repeat course B, repeat course C. That's no way to do it. Uh, they don't graduate, they drop out, they're not encouraged to continue. Our notion of a fifth year high school college prep year is very different. A youngster who fails certain courses, mm -hmm. needs remediation in those courses, is pulled out in, our, in the program and gets the kind of immersion required to pass the high school requirements. At what point would the student be pulled out? Be pulled out at the beginning of the fifth year. Okay. If you don't graduate after four years, you're pulled out in the fifth year. You're a separate cohort. But in addition to the immersion uh, that, that you need and are going to get, almost every youngster is good at something. The notion that, you know, that they're dummies and they can't handle any course is nonsense. So that those youngsters who can handle a particular college course level will have the opportunity to take a college course given by community college instructors, receive credit at, at the high school. At the high school, yeah. receive credit for that course if and when they matriculate in the college. This builds up the self-image of that youngster. You know, the, the, the typical one, the kid mm -hmm. who can't handle English, comes from uh, Latin America, comes from China, but does very well uh, in math or science, mm -hmm. social science. So that kid will need remediation in English, even in the fifth year. Right. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean that shouldn't be able to take a course uh, in, in math or sociology or history or what have you. So we think it's going to make a big difference. Uh, I was asked by the, by the two chancellors uh, to create an advisory committee to oversee this program. And uh, we've got a wonderful advisory committee. Uh, uh, Professor Seymour Saracen is one of the great figures in American psychology and education. Someone I've worked with for years has agreed to work on it. Uh, Diane Ravitch on one mm -hmm. side of the coin. Norman Fruchter on the other side of the coin. Luis Miranda, you must know Luis course, Miranda. Yeah. Yeah. I think he's, uh, he's a superb person. I worked with him on committees for a number of years. And uh, Evelyn Rich Jones, who is a tough-minded former high school principal in New York City, who had one of the worst and one of the best assignments in her career. Does she, this program exist anywhere in the country? Not that I know of. I, I was actually attracted to originally by the 13th year in Canada, which, which existed as mm -hmm. a program for a good number of years. Doesn't anymore. But uh, now with, the, with Harold and Matthew behind it, we're going to get moving. We're, uh, we're planning to start to pilot the program this coming fall. Well, of course, if if the uh, student stays on through the fourth year, then that student is more likely to want to do what you said. That's correct. The problem we have, of course, is those who drop out in the ninth and tenth grade. Well, for that you but this have might encourage them to stay too. It it it, it might indeed, because uh, I think the issue of self-image is absolutely crucial. And youngsters who are failing, if they think they don't have a chance to make it are even more apt to fail uh, and, and, and to drop out. And this is saying to every youngster, you've got something good in you, we'll help you where we need you. And of course, you have college now, mm -hmm. uh, wh which also uh, is supportive of the situation. I have other thoughts in mind, which I'm going to spring uh, on, on Harold and Matthew. Uh, for example, some kids, particularly in the primary grades, end up in schools which are very poor schools. Many, many kids end up in such schools, oh, yeah, all right? Sure. Including Sir schools. Well, that's why I was going to ask you, uh, wh what, what can we do or what more forceful action can the regions take about the schools that are on the region's review? Because it seems to me that some of those schools have been designated as poor schools by the Board of mm -hmm. Regions and uh, nobody seems to uh, take any serious action. You're right. We, we have uh, about 100 schools uh, under review, but nine of them are in New York City. And what we do is simply say to the school system, go ahead and improve it, and if you don't improve it, we'll close it down in two or three years. That's, that isn't enough. No. That, that, no. That's no. obvious. No. It isn't enough. Um, sure, uh, we're putting out new resource guides. We've got our fourth and eighth grade 
testing uh, system now, uh, which, is, which is helpful. But it seems to me that we have to play more of a hands-on role in New York City uh, than, than we have. I'm not saying we can solve all problems. We haven't solved the Roosevelt problem, by the way, even though we took it over directly. But there we made an error in the Roosevelt problem. We should have uh, appointed a, a board of education and held on to that appointed board until the system was in. Well, have the regions set a deadline by certain period of time that the schools should improve or yes. else be taken over? Two years. Two years. Now, what happens now is that about 15 schools each year seem to go off the list, mm -hmm. all right? But that means that some stay a lot longer than two or three. For example, we had a regulation to be implemented last fall which said there shall be no uncertified teachers in the SUR schools. Now, in January or February, we receive a report which says that the number of non-certified teachers in SUR schools is as great as ever. In other words, we didn't do enough to lean yeah. on the Board of Education and say, hey, get them out of those schools, come high, come hella high water. Well, again, Chancellor Levy, who participated in those decisions, you'd certainly uh, be willing to implement them. He will be a lot more sensitive uh, to, to the issues and to uh, blandishments and pressures uh, than his predecessors. The, uh, but getting back to youngsters, take, take a typical sc uh, school that's a primary school. I cannot believe that, in, let's say, a primary school of a thousand youngsters, mm -hmm. all right? There aren't 30 or 40 or 50 buried treasures in that school. I want to I, I identify them early, kindergarten, first grade, and I want to track them into an honors program at the very earliest stage. In the same school? In the same school, because okay. I think it's very unfair to those kids who get buried in, the, in these schools not to have the kind of opportunity you have in a typical suburban school or a, a school in a, in a wealthier enabled New York City to be identified and nurtured. So I'm going to spring that one on Harold to, tr to try take a few schools and take some control schools and see what happens if we find those 40 or 50 youngsters. Well, I'm sure you will, and I think uh, it's, a, it's a great idea. We'll be back after these important announcements. Sure. Late one night in Calvin Every week for the past four years, Stephanie has read stories to a room full of Savannah, Georgia preschoolers. Every week, the look on the children's faces is priceless. The love that Stephanie feels from every child has made her life a whole lot brighter. Even though Stephanie has never even seen their faces. To see how you can help in your community, call the Points of Light Foundation. Do something good. Feel something real. We're back today with Sal Cohen, who's the chairman in the Board of Regents of the Committee on Higher Education and Professional Education. You were telling us about some of the things you're going to... Uh, proposed to Chancellor Levy. Well, the other thing I'm going to uh, propose to him, we need more Towns and Harris's and Stuyvesant's and Bronx School of Sciences and Brooklyn Techs. I know we have some very good high schools in the city besides those, but when I see the thousands who apply to those four schools That's right, there's a and long list. don't get accepted, yeah. Yeah. And there, of course, it, 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 that will depend again upon collaboration well, you set with up, CUNY. You set up Townsend Harris. Uh, what, right. is, what is required to set up a school like that? Uh, a lot of political muscle and a lot of courage. Mm -hmm. I was accused, of course, on the one hand of being elitist, for trying to recreate an elitist school. Uh, and then some of the better high schools in western Queens, but not the best, felt that I would be robbing them of their students. Well, we worked it out so that Hans Nairs draws citywide. Last year, you know, it was listed as the number one high school in the mm -hmm. city. The trick of Townsend Harris High School is not just to recreate that classical school that you folks knew in New York City until 1942. That was a three-year high school with automatic uh, admission guaranteed right. to City College. What we did here was the fourth year is a collaboration between college and high school, and every youngster in the fourth year in a team teaching situation 
takes a set of courses at the college with college faculty and gets credit for it. So it's, you know, it's an equivalent of an AP kind of experience. Uh, of course, we're lucky there. The, we managed to get the school built uh, on Queens College property. That was yeah. the last promise that Donald Manis made and Claire Schulman kept it. I, <laughs> I worked that one pretty hard. Yeah. But I, you know, I see Lehman College, City College. No, I would like to do it uh, next to every college that we have. Yeah, that's what I university. mean. Because you see, one of the reasons that we lose so many people from New York City is the quality of the public schools. Right. And if we can improve the quality of the public schools, uh, I would be all for it. And the best way to do it now that we have this relationship between the two chancellors is to uh, find space, which I know we can, mm -hmm. in every one of the uh, colleges. So that will be my next uh, uh, pressure on Harold. Okay. Now, but let me take up one area which I know yep. uh, you and I are very concerned about because your committee has to do with professional education. Mm -hmm. And the whole subject of teacher education has been a big problem for us at right. CUNY. I think that uh, uh, we've done a very poor job at some of the colleges of CUNY, and we're now trying to uh, set up a, uh, a dean for teacher education to make sure that mm -hmm. all of the graduates of the CUNY schools uh, come up to the level that the regions properly requires they should come up with. We've had a threefold strategy, yeah. Herman. Our first strategy was to improve the academic standards at the schools, public schools. And I chaired that elementary and secondary committee for three years, and we instituted those standards. We then sat back and said, wait a minute, you know that you just can't demand higher standards from youngsters unless you demand higher standards from teachers. So for the last two years, we've been crafting a series of regulations which will reform teacher education, and they really will. Uh, now again, we're running into the same kind of opposition that we ran in with the CUNY remediation days. Because the opposition says, look, we can't find teachers now. You are talking about setting up a higher set of standards. We will have fewer teachers. Same argument you right, got exactly at CUNY. Right. And our answer to that was nonsense. You make this a more stronger, more desirable university, you'll get more students, not fewer students. We have 20,000 teachers, that is, uh, graduates, who take the teaching exam right now in New York State every year. 6,500 take jobs in New York State, that's all. Another, I'd say, roughly 6,000 take jobs in surrounding states. The rest disappear. So it's a big pool. So when we say, yeah, we'll shrink the pool, but we will get better prepared, more dedicated, more professionally oriented. We'll stay in the system. To stay in the system. Right now, the system's a revolving door. In New York City, one out of every three new teachers disappears in three or four years. So what are the highest right, standards so, you propose? Ah, what are we doing? First of all, they have to pass three exams, not two exams. Believe it or not, until our committee went to work, they did not have to pass a competency exam in their subject mm -hmm. until five years, until they were permanent teachers. We said, ah, uh -uh, you've got to pass that exam. In other words, if you before. want to teach math or history, you've you have to You've got to pass, pass a competency exam, exam math, math and, and history. history. Right. Simple proposition, right? right. Mm -hmm. uh, secondly, uh, what we have said is that in your training, 12 credits, a, a, a normal program runs between 30 and 36 credits, 12 credits of your graduate training has to be in the teaching of that subject. Again, hardly a revolutionary right, thought, but we're instituting it. Third thing, the issue of the master's degree. Uh, right now, st uh, a teacher has five years to get a master's degree. Many of them never finish and drop out of the system. We've said no. You have to have that master's degree within four years, provided that you show us that you've made progress in the first three years. And you have to have passed about 24 credits. Mm -hmm. I think that's what we'll end up with. That will imbue a greater sense of professionalism in the teacher. Does that mean that every teacher should have a master's degree? Uh, in, in order to get a permanent license, mm -hmm. everyone right. will have yeah. to have a master's degree. The fourth thing is we're requiring that every teacher have professional development 
175 hours over a five-year period for all new teachers. We haven't specified hours for existing teachers. Rather, they have to respond to a plan which relates to the weaknesses in the school itself as well as their own weaknesses. Uh, so you've got that. You've got mentoring, which is, uh, uh, which is going to be required of every teacher uh, in the first year. Then we're going after second career teachers that are second career people. Okay, but before you get to that, yeah. uh, on to the basic teachers, who opposes that? Does the UFT support it? UFT is supporting everything except our requirement uh, that the master's degree has to be finished in four years with a 24 credit uh, gate. Uh, and my, my argument there is simple. Uh, I sincerely believe that graduate training helps to professionalize a teacher. Uh, and that secondly, uh, someone who doesn't invest in graduate training is far, far less likely to invest mm -hmm. in teaching as a profession. They feel it's putting too much pressure on the teacher. We say, you put pressure on students, put pressure on teachers as well. So that's what we're doing there. Second career people, we want people uh, who have, let's say, an advanced a person who works as a chemist, who wants right. to go back and teach. We say to that person, well, you don't have to go back and take a master of education. We're saying to the schools of education, go ahead do a package which simply certifies that that chemist is able to teach. Usually they can do 18 uh, plus credits. So we're, do, we're, we're doing that uh, as well. I think it's going to end up with a much stronger group uh, of professional teachers. It will close the revolving door. Well, Randy Weingarten was here yeah. some time ago and she said that the problem is that there's a shortage in the next uh, this year and right. next few years of 54,000 mm -hmm. teachers. Mm -hmm. Do you think uh, it will be possible to meet that shortage? Yes, because I repeat, part of the issue of the shortage is the revolving door. I think the, the stronger the standards you set, the surer you are that those who do go into teaching will stay in teaching. What about the issue of teacher salary? She says that the basic problem, in the city at least, is the differential between the salaries in the city and in the suburbs, which are no about $20,000 no higher question. in the suburbs. No question. And starting salaries, the differential is about seven or 8000 goes up to 20000 plus. There are two things here. First of all, the sooner a teacher receives the master's degree, the sooner that salary jump occurs at the MA level, which is about five or $6,000. Secondly, though, what do legislators respond to? And you're an old hand at this. Mm -hmm. They respond to crises, correct? Mm -hmm. You want to get higher salaries in New York City? Go ahead. Create, uh, not create, it will, the crisis of teacher shortage will force New York City to address the problem rather than hide from it. We had the same argument with the standards in the, in the schools, you know. We were, we were accused by everyone of mandating standards, although there was no money for it, right? My attitude there was, uh-uh, the legislature will never give you money if you say, I need the money so exactly. I can impose standards. It's the reverse. Oh, well, no. That's the, problem. That. that's the problem we had. They told me the same thing, that rather than press for higher standards last year, I should have asked for more money. Right. I said, no, no. If we get higher standards, we will get more money, and that's what happened with the legislature. This Absolutely. Year, this year, we are getting money without having to pressure them because they feel that the university is going up exactly the same. And point. we got the nine million dollars, which the regents, that was one of the bases for our approving the remediation policy, was that we knew, we were convinced that the legislature and the governor would provide the money that was needed to sustain these emergent exactly. programs. Yeah. Now, you were also keeping the pressure on us at uh, the city university to make sure that at every college we graduate teachers. We don't give teachers a degree unless they're able to pass the teachers. Ah, account. here's another yeah. one. We are going to put colleges on review, registration right. review, right. like we put schools. Right. If 80% or more of your students do not pass the certification exams, you'll be put on review. We'll give you two years to remedy things or you close down. We're also re-registering every single uh, college of education right now uh, there are about 120 colleges with 1,000 programs. 
We're reviewing every single program. We actually got money from the legislature for staff to help in this review. We fully intend to close down marginal schools of education. Uh, I, I agree respond. because I don't, I don't, I think it's unforgivable to give someone a degree uh, for, to teach and then right. find they can't pass the teacher's exam. Yeah. Yeah. That, that is intolerable. I'm, I'm delighted to hear you're going to put us under review because I think there's no reason why we cannot meet that standard at every one of the colleges of the city university. Unfortunately, we're out of time, but thank you for coming. It's today. been fun, Herman. Thanks. Okay. Thanks. Very good. Great. <laughs>